What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to another audiobook. Now, we are going to Lonely Freddy. It... <laughs> this story was released like two years ago, and I still haven't done an audiobook on it, so here you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry that this has taken so long to make, and obviously out of stock is going to take uh, a while as well, but we're going to get through this, finally, uh, so that like once Lonely Freddy and Out of Stock are done, I've finished all of the Fazbear Frights, audiobooks, which is insane. Uh, I absolutely love these books, and Lonely Freddy is okay. It's it's a pretty good story. Um, the ending will surprise you. It's it's like a Darman video. The ending will shock you. Uh, anyway, I think we should just get straight into this. I hope you enjoy. Make sure you subscribe if you do. Uh, obviously, I'm going to be doing little kind of talks during the book, so yeah, you, you know what I mean. Uh, also, I'm sorry for the highlights, um, but yeah. Bad, Alec had always argued, was such a subjective word. With its every definition, it was determined by someone else's baseline. It was a word that served one purpose, to judge. And Alec had been judged his entire life. His first memory was a decidedly terrible one. He was in preschool and bigger than the other kids. Recognising this advantage at an early age, he found he could move to the front of any line with surprising ease. The other kids were glad to play the games he dictated, and he never had to look for a seat at the lunch table. It was only when his preschool teacher pulled him to the side on that first memorable day that Alec was made to understand that he was bad. You're a bully, the teacher had said to him, a word he assumed was positive and smiled when she offered it. Instead of patting him on the shoulder like his mum would do when he ate his whole meal, the teacher shrank away from him in horror. In fact, it was that precise expression on his preschool teacher's face that Alec remembered most of all. More than the way the blue plastic chairs in the classroom would stick to the backs of his legs in the summertime. More than the way a fresh box of unused crayons smelled under his nose. More than the way the canned peaches they served as snacks slid around on his tongue amid the sticky syrup and metallic aftertaste. Alec didn't even remember his preschool teacher's name. He simply remembered her look of horror when he didn't understand that he was bad. As he grew older, Alec came to realise that bad was defined by comparison, and that was mostly a workable construct for Alec, until Hazel come al came along. Hazel, who was named after a beloved grandmother Alec had never met. Hazel, whose fine blonde ringlets were tied up. Uh, sorry, twisted up in stiff bows. Hazel, who slept through the entire night with nary a fuss. Alec was named after no one. It was a compromise between the Alexander his mum had wanted and the Eric his dad had, had lob lobbied for. Alec's curls were unruly, tamed with water from the tap and a wooden backed brush. Sorry, Alec's nights were cleaved by nightmares and bouts of loud wakefulness. For the first five years of his life, Alec's behaviour was more or less in constant search of the walls separating good from bad. After Hazel was born, Alec jumped the wall and landed in uncharted lands. He was not as easily tracked in this new space. He was bad sometimes, yes, but more often than not, he was boundless. He went undiscovered. It was in that space that good and bad didn't exist. If there was no one guiding him to his boundaries, if there was no one watching, behaviour, if anything, was an afterthought. Maybe don't single him out as often, Meg, Alex Aunt Gigi would say. Gigi? Gigi? Yeah, Gigi, I think it would be. Kids respond so much better to positive reinforcement. Aunt Gigi had also suggested to Alex's mum in that same conversation that, the, that she switched to organic milk. The added hormones in regular dairy increased aggression in kids, according to some studies. Testosterone. Uh, Aunt Gigi had no children and no desire for any. Alec's mum was often in the mood for advice, and her older sister was always happy to give it. Gigi, it's not the milk, Alec's mum had argued. They drink the same milk, and he's not aggressive, he's just... I don't know. He's in his own world. It's like the rules don't apply to him. Well, then you know that he'll be a leader when he's older. That's great, Aunt Gigi had pos posited. Yeah, Alec's mum had said. Maybe, I don't know. He doesn't seem to like other people much. He's ten, Meg. They hate everyone. Not everyone, his mum had argued. Look at Gavin. Who? Becca's son. That kid who's always smiling at everyone? That isn't a bad thing, his mum had said. No, it's a creepy thing, Aunt Gigi had said. Trust me, you don't want more little Gavins running around the world. 
That's the kind of kid you find standing over your bed one night holding a butcher knife. No thanks. It was times like those that Alec wondered if he'd been born to the wrong sister, and Aunt Gigi was really his mum. But he's, his turned up nose and blonde hair, like hay, were dead ringers for his mum. No question. It was also times like these that Alec wished he wasn't so good at eavesdropping. His parents had warned him about it many times, but inevitably he'd find himself perched at the top of the staircase, listening to the conversations no one really tried that hard to hide. It was almost like they wanted him to hear. Eavesdropping was how he found out about the plan. Alec probably should have seen it coming. It was April, after all. The magical miracle month, otherwise known as, their, as the month their precious Hazel was born. Alec got a day, the 18th day of August, to be precise. That was his special day when his parents pretended he wasn't a problem. But Hazel, Hazel got a full 30 days of adora adoration. Someone's got a special day coming up in two weeks, his dad would say. Are you excited for your party? His mum would ask. And, a and Hazel's eyes would glitter, and she'd act like it was all too much fuss, and his parents would eat it up. She'd earned it, they would say. She should enjoy it. Then they'd look at Alec and wait for him to agree, which he rarely did. Why bother? It's not like it would change a thing. She'd still get the party. Maybe it would have been decent of him to be nice to Hazel once in a while, but Alec just couldn't see giving his parents the satisfaction. So when he overheard his parents discussing the plan, he was frankly surprised it had taken him this long to come up with it. They must have been behind on their reading. It's in chapter 5. Have you gotten to chapter 5 yet? Alec's mum asked his dad across the kitchen table where they stirred their decaf coffee that night. I thought chapter 5 talked about letting the child choose his own road, his dad said. That tone of exasperation in his voice was becoming more of a regular thing. No, 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 that's from the glowing child, corrected his mum. I'm talking about the plan planner. This doctor says the glowing child's theories are all wrong. Alec remembered the, gr the glowing child method well. Apparently that author believed every child was simply a blob of clay waiting to be self-moulded, which involved some completely bonkers exercises, like letting Alec rename himself. So he decided on Captain Thunderpants and spent the entire week farting himself around the house and claiming he couldn't help it. It was his namesake. That wasn't as ridiculous as the time they read that they needed to plant a garden with him so, they could so he could nurture something, or the time they were told to go camping as a family to get back to their familial core. The garden experiment ended when Alec buried his mum's wedding ring in the soil to see if it would grow some more diamonds. The camping trip devolved into a sort of Lord of the Fly situation after Hazel got a mosquito stuck up her nose and Alec may or may not have convinced her that it would lay eggs in her nasal passage. The trip didn't... The trip really didn't have a chance after that. Honestly, Meg, the more we read, the more I'm convinced that none of these so-called doctors know what the heck they're talking about, his dad said. But Alec's mum was not uh, one to be deterred. Well, Ian, what's the alternative? Do we give up? This wasn't the first time Alec had heard a conversation like this one. It seemed to happen in the spaces between every other book that his parents would read to try to understand why their son was just so different than them. It wasn't the first time Alec had heard this sort of conversation, and yet it would form the same hard stone in his stomach every single time. Because no matter how many books they read or gardens they made him plant or organic milk they poured down his throat, the one thing they never tried was talking to him. Of course we don't give up, his dad said to his mum, whipping the little teaspoon around the sides of his coffee mug until Alec imagined it forming a little decaf whirlpool against the ceramic. Just ask me. Alec whispered, and for just a second, for once in all of his 18, uh, 18, 15 years, his parents were both silent, and he thought maybe they'd hear him. Just ask me what's the matter. If they asked, he might have said, I'm not like you, and I'm not like Hazel, and that should be okay. But his parents simply went on talking. You just need to skip ahead to chapter 5, his mum said. Can we skip ahead to the part where you tell me what we're supposed to be doing? His dad said. Just read the chapter, Ian. The party's next weekend, and I really think we need to lay some groundwork before Saturday. His dad sighed so heavily Alec could hear it from the stairs, which is how he knew that his dad would once again read a useless book about some useless method for helping them to understand their enigma of a child. It was the same every time. And because his parents always stashed their collection of parenting books in some super secret location Alec had never been able to discover, 
he'd be starting from a disadvantage like always, watching the plan and Chapter 5's contents unfold over the course of the next week. Upstairs in the Jack and Jill bathroom that separated Alex's room from Hazel's, he stared in the mirror and tried to see himself the way his parents did. They saw the same blonde hair, the same light green eyes, the same jaw set in rigid determination to never hang open in amazement, to never break into an unexpected smile. Alec was nothing if not deliberate. It was only Hazel who occasionally took him by surprise. Are you okay? She asked from her doorway, and he fixed his face in annoyance. Sorry, I've got to give her a little girl's voice. Are you okay? <laughs> uh, but he was a little too late in doing so, and he was afraid she'd seen him startled. Why wouldn't I be? He asked, levelling her with the same type of question he always asked. He had mastered the art of deflection. Hazel shrugged and grabbed her toothbrush, playing at being nonchalant too, but she wasn't nearly as good as, at it as he was. Mum and Dad are acting weird again, she said, shorthand for the explanation. She meant Mum and Dad are picking on you again, but Alec wasn't so easily fooled. His sister was the worst of them. She conned everyone else with her questions that pretended to be in innocent, and a smile might have sorry, and a smile that might have made anyone else think she meant it. Don't worry, he said. It won't affect your party. He'd meant for it to be a slight on her, but she misunderstood and thought he actually cared. I don't really care that much about the party, you know, she said, looking at his reflection in the mirror instead of looking directly at him. That's how he knew she was lying. She started to brush her teeth, and Alec took a moment to study her as she looked down into the sink to spit. It's almost like she was able to will every part of herself to be perfect. Her hair never frizzed, her nose never ran, her freckles were evenly spaced as though they'd been painted on by a steady hand. Even her teeth were straight. She'd probably never need braces. Alec had started to believe he'd never get his braces off. Don't be dumb, he finally said. Of course you care about your stupid party. Her face flushed a perfectly even shade of pink. I bet not that many people will even come, she said. Alec couldn't even muster a response to such a ridiculous plea for fake sympathy. He just snorted. Yeah, okay, he said, and left her to finish swishing the toothpaste from her mouth. The day of getting his own bathroom in his own house with his own rules and no one to wonder why he was so different than them. The day couldn't come soon enough. Stars had begun to dot to dot the sky when Alex's trance was broken by the creak of the bathroom door on Hazel's side. He waited for the inter uh, interruption to pass, but the longer he waited, the more it became clear that Hazel wasn't in there to go to the bathroom. After another few seconds, the door to his room from the bathroom opened a crack, and in spilled the blonde curls of his sister as she broke a cardinal rule. Get out, he said, and she snatched her head back into the bathroom, startled. But that didn't last. Instead, she opened the door a little wider, and to Alex's utter disbelief, she dared to take a step inside his room. He watched her look around for a second, as though she'd entered a strange new world, and in a way, she had. If he'd ever suspected that she snuck in here when he wasn't around, that question was answered by the way she stared around her now. Uh, she was a rule follower, even when no one was looking. You have a death wish, he said, and he could hear her swallow. Still... She took another step toward him. He had a couple of options. The usual verbal intimidation wasn't working. He could use brute force. Pain was an excellent motivator. He could play at charging her, whip the covers off of himself and lunge out of the bed just far enough to chase her off. Or he could exercise psychological trickery. He could lie there perfectly still, saying not even a single word more. He could watch her as closely as he was watching... Yeah, as he was watching her now, wait for her to get close to achieve whatever insane goal she must have for coming in here and defying all logic, and watch her courage falter the deeper she vent ventured into his room. Maybe it was the thrill of exerting that level of control over the situation, or maybe he was curious to see what she'd do. Either way, he opted for the third option, and he waited. Strangely, for as closely as he studied her, Hazel studied him just as closely back. She took another step toward his bed, then another and though he could tell she was trembling, could see that from the second she popped her head in, she continued to walk forward. It wasn't just it wasn't until she was just a couple steps from his bed that she noticed she was holding something. She took the last two steps fast, as though her courage was expiring, and set the thing at the foot of Alex's bed. Then she took two steps backward, 
spinning on her heel and sprinted back into the bathroom, pulling the door to his bedroom closed behind her. Alex stared at the book at the foot of his bed for a long time before he finally picked it up. It was green with bold white lettering, the title precisely centred and slightly raised from the jacket. It was flagged with a bright pink sticky note right at the start of chapter 5. And when he opened it, written, eh, written, written in the fine pencil script of his mother's careful hand were notes for his dad and her to follow in the days leading up to Golden Hazel's party. Defying their parents, defying all logic and rules and self-interest, Hazel had stolen the plan planner from their parents' secret library while they slept, and she had shared it with him. Alex's heart raced as he read through the carefully prescribed steps of chapter 5, the method that promised to turn their bad child good and achieve the familial harmony his parents had read over and over was achievable. Then, when he was done thumbing through the pages his father hadn't yet bothered to read but had agreed to try out on their problematic firstborn, Alex stared at the closed bathroom door his sister had gathered the courage to open, knowing the wrath she'd surely incur. He'd wondered for the rest of his night about why she had done it. What sort of game was she playing at? What kind of sorcery was she practicing, trying to lull him into a false sense of camaraderie? Then he allowed his memory to fall backward. He retraced the times he had confused her in the past, the moments he'd simply assumed she was attempting to throw him off his game. There was the time she baked him cookies in her toy oven after his parents had ignored his pleas for sweets at the grocery store. There was that one moment during the doomed camping trip when she had laughed at an unintentional joke he'd made, even as she clawed desperately at her nose for the rogue mosquito. There was that one Mother's Day when she'd added his name to the card because he'd forgotten. Alex stared out his window for the rest of the night, until the dotted stars gave way to the blue dawn before sunrise. It was too tempting to believe that his sister had brought him the book, because an alliance had suddenly seemed like a good idea. Ten years of watching the uncanny spell she could cast on his parents and the rest of the world had taught him she wasn't to be so easily trusted. No, he thought, as night crept into day. This is just another trick. She'd been able to fool everyone else but him up to this point. A phony peace offering wasn't about to trick him into thinking she was suddenly on his side. Still, it unsettled him a little that he, that he didn't know what exactly she was up to. There was really only one way to solve that mystery. I'll play along, he whispered to himself. She'll show her cards eventually. You're making it too complicated, Hazel said. It seemed like she was, trying, she was taking to this new alliance with surprising comfort. They were sitting by the pool in the backyard, their feet dangling in the chlorinated water as the sun beat against their backs. Alex didn't need a mirror to know his neck was starting to glow pink. What are you talking about? It's the perfect plan, he said. Alec was in such a habit of coldly dismissing his sister, it was exceptionally difficult to pretend to take her seriously. But if he was going to discover what trap she was, uh, it was she was trying to lure him into, he had to be convincing. Strangely though, in pretending to take her advice, he was starting to see her differently. It was weird the way this person he was so closely related to was suddenly becoming whole in front of him, like he'd been living with a hologram this whole time. She was completely formed con artist. Sorry, she was a completely formed con artist. So let me get this straight, she said, rolling her eyes skyward. Your big plan to get mum and dad to stop thinking you're a total sociopath is to act like a total sociopath? After reading chapter 5 the night before, Alec learnt that the plan was a grossly simplistic take on the teenaged brain. If parents wanted a well-behaved, predictable child, they simply needed to treat them as the opposite of that. It was the worst in hokey uh, reverse psychology, and nothing irked Alec more than having his intelligence insulted. So his counter plan was simple. He'd just act worse. Way, way worse. He was pretending, of course. He knew his counter plan was a terrible one, but he needed Hazel to be the one to come up with the idea, not him. It was the only way to make her believe he was falling for a gesture of sibling love. Once her guard was down, he'd be able to figure out what she was actually up to. How am I the sociopath in this scenario? He asked, trying hard not to f actually feel offended. It's just an act, he reminded himself. It's just an act. They think the best way to make me look good is to treat me like I'm bad. Alec added in mock outrage. If you ask me, that's pretty, that is pretty sociopathic. 
Now he was fake arguing that fake acting bad was the best way to counteract his parents' fake anger at his real bad behaviour. It was all getting very meta. Alec could feel a headache forming behind his eyes. Look, said Hazel, suddenly sounding older than her almost ten years. Don't take this the wrong way, but you've been sort of losing your touch. My touch, Alec said, putting his hand on the hottest part of his neck to try and shield it. Only yesterday, Hazel would have been terrified to see this blunt with him, to be this blunt with him. Maybe he really was losing his, knit, his knack for intimidation. You used to be pretty good at hiding it, she said, and she looked hard at him, so she knew, so, sorry, sorry, so he knew she was waiting for him to catch on. When he didn't answer, she sighed and said, You used to get away with a lot more. How's that my fault? He said, not really liking the way he sounded pouty. If anything, it's your fault. She blinked at him slowly. They only started to think I was the bad one. When they figured out you were the good one. Hazel looked back down at the water. And this time, he thought maybe he saw something of the old Hazel, the one who seemed to tip her around him with an apology on her lips like it was a lost cause, thinking they'd ever be friends. To Alec's great amazement, he felt a twinge of remorse for that, a feeling he quickly buried. Okay, what's your counter plan? he asked. Her solution was too simple. Be good, she said. Alec laughed. What else could he do? That's your master pla uh, that, that's your master class in playing our parents reverse reverse psychology she shrugged if you're a little better and I'm a little worse maybe it will neutralize the attention enough for them to leave us alone for a change Alec let his jaw do that thing where it dropped he let his body experience the full shock he had restrained for so long and he did it in front of the least likely person golden hazel the child who did what she was told when she was told to do it. The straight A's and the coordinated piano fingers, the dish clearer and their classroom helper, the easy parent slash teacher conference, the perfect child. Maybe she didn't want to be perfect anymore. How had it never occurred to him that his lot in the family was just as burdensome as hers? Why had the tiny sparkle in her eye never caught his attention? The one that said, let's trade places for today. When had she stopped being golden hazel and simply started being hazel, a kid? All the more reason not to trust her, he thought. His resolve hardening. She was tired of pretending to be the good one. She was ready to advance to full bad kid status, which meant she was definitely up to something. Do you think you can do it? He asked, not meaning it as a challenge, but as an actual question. Be bad? Can you be good? She asked. And from her, it was definitely, it definitely was a challenge. They agreed to test her theory that night as a sort of trial run. Their parents were obviously committed to their own experiment prescribed by the plan planner. They'd been on Alec's case all day. They'd scolded him for failing to pull his clothes from the clothesline. They had admission, ad, am, admonished them for playing video games before completing his homework, even though it was spring break. They'd lectured him on the importance of flossing, a strange battle to pick after a spotless checkup during his most recent dental cleaning. By the time dinner rolled around, Alec's face hurt from smiling. His neck was sore from nodding. His blood had boiled so many times that day, he was surprised he hadn't cooked from the inside out. He'd swallowed every scolding, never caving to the temptation of sassing his parents. And true to her word, at each, confronta <coughs> at each confrontation throughout the day, Hazel had been there to take a portion of the burden away from Alec. She'd chosen... Uh, that morning to show their mum the less than stellar grade on her spelling test from the previous week. She'd accidentally dropped her dad's shirt in the mud when she pulled them from the clothesline, and in response to the great flossing debate of Monday afternoon, she had marked a first for herself. Hazel mouthed off. How many cavities did you have at your last checkup? She muttered with an earshot of their mother. Young lady, what's gotten into you today? Their mum said. And as Alec and Hazel rounded the corner to retreat to their separate bedrooms after dinner time, they tapped fingertips and hid their smiles. But as soon as Alec closed uh, his own bedroom door, he reviewed every moment from the day to analyse his sister's actions, the way she'd jump in too readily to deflect the scolding meant for him, the way she'd been so ready with a smart comeback to their mum, the time she winked conspiratorially at him at the dinner table. It was all just a little too perfect, this little show she was putting on for him. 
You're not clever enough to play this game, he thought that night before he went to bed. You're in way over your head, sis. He had five years on her, playing of, of playing the role of the bad seed. If she thought she was going to usurp that title, she was in for a rude awakening. The next day was more or less a repeat of the previous one, when their parents decried, decreed sorry, uh, Alex's lack of manners at, their, at the breakfast table. Hazel burped. When Alex's dad accused him of scratching the side of the car with his bike, Hazel unapologetically took the blame. When Alex's mum wondered aloud when the last time was that Alec had ingested a vegetable, Hazel's quick response was to ask when the last time was that their parents had cooked an edible one. That night, as Hazel joined Alec on his perch at the top of the stairs, they listened to their parents puzzle through the last two days. Is it just me, or does Hazel seem to be going through a phase? Their mum whispered to their dad, teaspoons clinking against the side of their coffee mugs. I thought it was just my imagination at first, their dad agreed. Their parents' awe was unmistakable. Did you hear what she said to me this afternoon? Their mum asked. She actually said she thought I was starting to look haggard. Haggard, Ian. Do I look haggard? No, but you sound haggard, Alec muttered. Hazel had to stifle a laugh, but Alec was too irritated to find the humour. His parents were infuriating. Was it really so unbelievable that Hazel could be even nastier than predictably rotten Alec? Well, could anyone blame you for being haggard? Their father said. Ooh, wrong answer, Hazel whispered. And this time, Alec did find the humour, and his laugh caught him off guard. So then I do look haggard, their mum said, and Alec could hear a teaspoon clinking faster and faster against the ceramic. One of them was compulsively stirring. Of course not, Meg. Can we try to focus on the kids? He said, and their mum let out a single, uncharitable ha. Oh, now look who's ready to be the adult, said their mum. And Alec and Hazel both leaned back on their step, grimacing. That's not going to go over well, said Alec. Really, Meg? I just think that... Oh, I know what you think. You made that perfectly clear. Good grief, Ian. Grow up. But when Alec looked over at Hazel, she was simply smiling, as though the whole thing were going exactly according to plan. Of course, from her perspective, it was. Then she turned her smile to him. If Alec hadn't been able to see right through her, she, he might have been tempted to believe it was just genuine. If he were the type to fall for such an obvious manipulation, he might have even felt a hint of warmth toward her, a sister simply in search of an actual relationship with her brother. It was kind of cute, he thought, how she believed she could outsmart him. <laughs> okay, okay, their dad said, and Alec heard him pull in a deep breath. We can't turn on each other. Their mother sighed, you're right. Let's just go to bed, it's been a long day. Oh, and I can't find the book, FYI. Forget it, their dad said. We'll look for it in the morning. Two sets of chair legs scraped against the kitchen tiles, and Alec and Hazel jumped to their feet and slipped into their rooms just as the light on the stairs switched on, announcing their parents' approach. Lying in bed, Alec thought through all the variations in his own plan, the counter to his counter plan, as it were. Tomorrow was party planning day. He heard his mum remind his dad about it a thousand times, not that it mattered since he'd be at work and she would be dragging Alec and Hazel along to meet Aunt Gigi at the pizzeria instead. It was there that Alec would really ramp up his re reconnaissance. Reconnaissance, yeah, I don't know. If he was going to discover what Hazel was actually up to, he would discover it in the place where all of these plans and counter plans were to culminate. He could think of no other reason for why Hazel was so determined to sabotage her own birthday party by allowing Alec to be, well, himself. It had something to do with her birthday on Saturday. Whatever she was planning, it would all go down then. Alec's only real option was to sit back and let Hazel show her cards. It was a matter of time before it happened, and though she'd proven herself more cunning than he'd originally given her credit for, she was no evil genius. That title was reserved for Alec. Sometime after Alec heard his parents' bedroom door shut for the night, the door from the bathroom he shared with Hazel opened and she poked her head inside. Today was fun, she said, and Alec made a quick switch to his conspiring brother act. Yeah, he said. Nice job with the cooking dig, he said. Thanks. Hazel laughed shyly. Oh please, Alec thought, but he managed to keep from rolling his eyes. 
Hey, don't you think we're gonna, like, break them or anything, do you? Sorry, I said that completely wrong. Hey, you don't think we're gonna, like, break them or anything, do you? Hazel said. Nah, he said. They can handle it. Trust me, I've put them through a lot worse. Hazel nodded, then gave him one more shy smile before shutting the door and padding across the back bathroom back to her own room. It was a few minutes before Alec noticed that he was smiling too. Not smiling because he was recounting all the ways he'd beaten his sister at her own game. Not smiling because he'd exposed her for the fraud she is for their parents and friends and everyone else in the world to see. Not yet anyway. He was smiling because he was enjoying her company. Get a grip, Alec, he scolded himself. Then he repeated to himself over and over that she wasn't as good as she pretended to be. That she was only using him as a, ma as a means to an end. He reminded himself that his alliance was false and temporary. That once he'd revealed her as a fraud, they'd go back to their separate ends of the bathroom and Alec could proceed unfettered, unfettered in doing whatever it was he wanted to do, only this time without the constant comparison to Golden Hazel. Then he wiped that pathetic smile from his face and fell asleep with vengeance on his mind. Gigi, what do you think? Should we kick in for the extra Fazbear Fun Witches? <gasps> what? what is a Fazbear Fun Witch? <laughs> Uh, like a sandwich? Oh, that's so stupid. <laughs> Alec and Hazel's mum had a, was a wreck on Wednesday. She'd overslept her alarm and had to shove Alec and Hazel into the car without taking a shower or even brushing her teeth. Her hair was jammed into submission under an old baseball cap, and the dark circles under her eyes made her look almost skeletal under the shadow of the hat brim. Hazel hadn't made it much better by asking her in her most concerned voice if she was coming down with something because she looked absolutely sickly, and Alec hadn't made it any better by being nice. You look fine, Mum, he'd said, which threw her mum for such a loop. She could only blink at them both before snapping at them to buckle up and running two stop signs in order to meet Aunt Gigi on time at Freddy Fazbear's. Now she was standing in the party room with a thoroughly unenthused party prepper who was waiting impatiently on answers about Saturday. What on earth is a fun witch? Aunt Gigi asked, leaning her hand on a table and immediately lifting it after detecting something sticky. It's a, um, it's a, their mum tried, but she was distracted by the sight of Alec and Hazel seeming to play together on the skee-ball machines. You are truly terrible at this game, Alec said. I am not, said Hazel, but after her third gutter ball in a row, Alec just laughed. Okay, it's not my best event, she said. I shine more in the pinball category. Can you even see over the controllers? He asked, rubbing the top of her head roughly. Hazel smiled and so did Alec, but for a different reason. He felt refreshed after a good night's sleep, renewed in his mission to bring his sister down. It's a delicious croissant roll stuffed with your choice of fried macaroni, tater tots or chocolate marshmallow, the party prepper deadpanned to Aunt Gigi. That sounds utterly repulsive, Aunt Gigi said. The party prepper didn't argue. Yeah, but it's only $20 more, and honestly, I'm just not sure if the Super Sunrise party package comes with enough food, their mum fretted, finally taking her gaze from the kids and returning to the task at hand. So, that's a yes on the Fazbear Fun Witch platter with extra dipping sauces, said the party prepper, by now having just ha about enough of this entire interaction. Yes, let's do it, said their mum, clearly relieved at having made the big decision. I have these coupons from the paper for Foxy's Pirate Palooza Special. Can I use those? Hey, fun fact, this is actually one of the tickets, like the coupon tickets, in the survival logbook. Fun fact for you. While their mum and Aunt Gigi ironed out the last of the details, Alec and Hazel wandered the empty pizzeria out of earshot of their mum and aunt. So what's the big, uh, so what's the big deal with this place anyway? Alec said, worried he was giving himself away. The deep, dark truth was that he'd always wanted his own birthday party at Freddy Fazbear's, but he'd never made enough friends to justify the expense of a big party. Instead, his parents had always thrown together a haphazard a ha a ha celebration at home and called it a pool party, but it was hard to ignore the reality that the only other kids there were all of Hazel's friends she'd been allowed to invite in order to fill out the crowd. Hazel shrugged, finding nonchalance. I don't know. Liar. You've had your birthday here for the last four years in a row. It was the perfect double psych out. He'd goad her into telling him what was so important about her stupid party this year, and she'd just think he was trying to have a brotherly conversation with her. 
Why don't you tell me? She challenged, catching at Alec mid-stare. He hadn't realised what he was looking at until Hazel did, and then he quickly looked away. Nice try, she said, tilting her head toward the Yarg Foxy on stage. There he was, in all his piratey foxy greatness. This eye-patched, peg-legged, hook-wielding orange fox. In this restaurant, he was positioned as a human-sized uh, plush figure, propped by the stage, presumably there for taking pictures with. But he played a different role in every Freddy Fazbear's, sometimes greeting visitors at the door, sometimes playing in the band on stage with the others. Wherever he was, though, Alex saw him. He was without a doubt Alex's favourite character. It's possible, possible, that he used to sit a foot in a plastic flower pot and roll a cardboard tube around his hand and pr pretend to be Yark Foxy. Clearly, it was also possible that Hazel had, at some point, silently witnessed said roleplay. <laughs> Whatever, he said. Stupid kid stuff. And besides, we're talking about you, not me. They were standing in the aisle between the arcade and the stage now. Alec eyed the platform where Freddy Fazbear and all his friends performed animatronic routines. He was always a little unsettled by the way their robotic bodies were eerily still after the show, while the rest of the restaurant chimed with the clinks and buzzes of the games. He backed away from the stage unconsciously, and was only aware that he'd moved when the back of his heel hit something. He turned to find himself uncomfortably close to a raised platform, holding a smaller version of the bear on stage, only this bear had an unlit sign over it that read Lonely Freddy. It was a weird name for a toy, but the weirdest parts of it were harder to define. The bear stood stiff, almost at attention. Its eyes stared straight ahead at the stage, but Alec had the strangest feeling that it was still watching him. Maybe I want to. Maybe I want this year to be different, Hazel said, and Alec jumped a little at her voice. He'd gotten so lost in the staring Freddy that he forgot she was standing right there. So what? You want more presents? He asked. You know. You're going to get everything you want anyway, he said. And this time, he let a little of the venom escape. He couldn't help it. How ungrateful could she be? He was the only one who nobody liked. Who had to fight for everything. Who was constantly misunderstood. There's some stuff even mum and dad can't do, she said. And if Alec was starting to crack, Hazel was too. He could see her getting a little defensive. Trust me, for you... They'll move mountains. Hazel frowned at him. They try, you know. Yeah, they try for you. She set her jaw. The only reason they do so much stuff for me is because they feel so guilty for worrying so much about you. Do you have any idea how much time Dad spent planning that camping trip? Alec did know, as a matter of fact. He'd listened to them from the top of the stairs as they orchestrated every detail of the trip in order to keep Alec calm. Like he was some sort of bomb they had to keep from going off. His eyes drifted again to the bear. Alec got the strangest sensation, like he wanted to move their argument elsewhere. Lonely Freddy, Alec thought to himself. More like nosy Freddy. Hazel put her hands on her hips. I bet you didn't even know they moved here for you. What are you talking about? Alec said, genuinely confused. His guard was slipping, but this was a turn in events he hadn't been expecting. The only reason we live here instead of our old house is because this one's closer to Aunt Gigi and they think you like her more than you like them because she understands you, she said, twitching her fingers into air quotes. Well, Alex said, unable to argue, he did like this aunt better than, sorry, he did like his aunt better than his parents. Don't you think that maybe that hurt their feelings a little bit, she said, for you to like mum's sister better? What was going on here? Where was all this anger coming from? Alec was so confused. Hazel was acting like... like him. If they're so great and I'm so evil, Alec said, losing all sight of his counter-counter plan, then why are you helping me and not them? Of all moments to clam up, Hazel did just that. She recovered her facade faster than Alec did, which only worked to infuriate Alec more. She'd somehow managed to gain the upper hand despite his five years of experience on her. Hazel! Hazel, where are you? Hazel's green eyes stopped boring a hole through Alec long enough to call their mum. Coming! She turned on her heel and trotted around the corner toward the party room, leaving Alec in the company of the eavesdropping Freddy. What are you looking at? He snarled at the bear, and he had to suppress a chill because he swore he'd seen a reflection in the bear's eyes, almost like a flash.